Hi everybody, I'm Ted Blaine. This is my back porch of my house at Woodbury Forest School. It's April 7th, 2020, and it's the birthday of my good friend Jennifer Hubbard. Happy birthday, Jennifer. It's also a day when a lot of us are feeling a little bit confined and a little bit worried and a little bit concerned about this whole coronavirus thing. But my great worry this spring, one of my really great worries, was that I was never going to get to see the senior class to give them the life lessons that I have been giving here in this very room and in this very backyard for the past several years. Thanks, however, to the miracle of technology and to my good friend Tyler Campbell, who is the cameraman, we can bring these two crucial life lessons, not only to my English 600 students, but to the entire senior class and to whoever else is watching. So here we go. Remember, this virus thing eventually is going to disappear. Eventually it's going to be gone. And when it goes, we need to be ready to socialize. We need to be ready to get back together, to be doing things with each other. Today, you're going to learn two crucial life lessons. Number one, how to properly pack a cooler. And number two, how properly to cook meat on a grill. Now, let me show you how this works. This is my Coleman cooler, my larger cooler. Yes, I do have a Yeti. Thank you, Robert Singleton, for that. But it's really easy to cool things off in a Yeti. I want to show you how to cool things off in any old styrofoam cooler, any old Coleman cooler. This method works. For our demonstration today, I've chosen LaCroix water. This is the pure version, unflavored. This is not product placement. I promise you, I do not own stock in this company. I am not getting a kickback from LaCroix. In fact, until a couple of days ago, I was mispronouncing the name of this drink. I was calling it La Croix because I took an entire year of college French at the University of Virginia in one month, one summer. That's a different story. This is an American product. It's Midwestern. They want to say LaCroix, so let them say LaCroix. There's a tiny little town in Indiana called Monticello, Indiana. As a Virginian, I cringe whenever I hear them mispronounce the name of Mr. Jefferson's Little Mountain. But if they want to pronounce Monticello as Monticello, it's their business. Anyway, here we are back to the cooler. You can see that there is absolutely no ice in this cooler. I have packed this with two cases, 48 cans of LaCroix water. You may decide to use something very different. You may decide to go for something with a little more kick in it. Something like uh, oh, Arizona iced tea with sugar or Mountain Dew, though I, I hope not Mountain Dew with all that caffeine. You may pack this with whatever you like. This method works with aluminum, with plastic, with glass, it works with everything. My good friend Richard Barnhart went to Yale and while he was there he studied architecture. My good friend Tom Parker went to Williams and while he was there he studied American Studies. I went to Washington and Lee and I learned how to pack a cooler. And this method is tried and true. I've research this over many many years and it works. Sometimes people think that they're supposed to layer ice and then layer drinks, layer ice and layer drinks. That's a terrible method. The idea is to get as many drinks as possible cold with as little amount of ice. This bag of ice is problematic. I got this at the Harris Teeter in Charlottesville. Then I went down to the Whole Foods. By the time I got back to Woodbury this bag of ice had started to melt. So when I put it in the freezer it was pretty much a solid piece of ice. If we have a problem, we'll figure it out. Julia Child had these things happen all the time to her, and she just went with them. So I can see that I've got a big chunk of ice here. That's not desirable. In fact, this is a really terrible bag of ice.
but it's all right because we can use this bag of ice as emblematic of everything else that's gone wrong this spring just to guarantee that I look like Julia Child I brought my hammer out here why are you asking am I doing this I'm doing this because it's really important for us to have cubes of ice covering all of the drinks we just can't have a big iceberg here in the cooler Well, okay, we're going to close that, but we're not through. We are not finished. That ice is going to melt, and when that ice, when that ice melts, then we're going to put some more ice on top of it. The second layer of ice will be responsible for getting your beverages to the absolutely perfect temperature. Let's just let that work there for a while. It'll take a few minutes. Now let's go to life lesson two at the grill. So you can see that I'm pretty old school here with the grill. This is a traditional Weber grill. I like this a lot. I also use charcoal. This will work with gas grills just as well. But I want you all to see what I've done here. This is really important. You can see that the coals are only on half of the grill. They're only on one side of the grill. That's very, very important. What I have here, just for a sample, is a bag full of four skinless, boneless chicken thighs that have been marinating in teriyaki sauce. When I went to the Harris Teeter to get that notorious bag of ice back there, I also got these chicken thighs and they were out of the boneless, skinless chicken thighs. So I had to debone them myself. That's why you may be wondering why do these thighs look particularly badly butchered? I really am not a butcher and I am not particularly handy with one of those little paring knives. So that's why these don't look like the kind of thighs you buy at the grocery store. Why chicken thighs? Because they cook quickly and because I don't want to keep you all around here all day long. Notice what I'm doing here. I'm putting the thighs over the direct heat for their first cooking. What we're doing here, actually those don't look that bad when I look at them here on the grill. What we're doing here at first is searing the outside. We're doing what some people call caramelizing, some people call browning, some people call the Maillard effect. We're making sure that the sugars and the proteins in the chicken get exposure to plenty of heat and can turn the color of caramel. Some people, probably people who live in Monticello, Indiana, say caramel, and I'm just going to let them say that. I think it's important for the country to come together right now, and we really shouldn't bicker over things like pronunciation, though we could. Anyway, uh, you can see here that it's not taking long for these chicken thighs to become caramelized or browned or seared, whatever term you'd like to use. Gordon Ramsay likes to say that color equals flavor, except he says it in a British accent and it sounds a lot better, but I, I, I think he's right. Uh, this color is the indication that the outside of these chicken thighs will be very, very tasty on the human palate. Now, the problem, of course, with cooking over direct heat the whole time is that the outside could get overcooked before the inside 
has a chance to finish. So what I'm going to do is move these things to the side of the grill where there is no direct heat. This is a big one. I'm leaving this one here for a little longer. There's no direct heat over here. There's plenty of heat. This bank of coals is very, very hot. But as soon as we get sufficient color on each of these, yeah, that looks good. Then We'll move everything over here, and I'm going to put the lid on. The ventilation holes are open. The ventilation holes are open in the bottom. The heat, the air is being drawn up through these holes. It's going right past the chicken. There's plenty of cooking going on in here, but this is going to cook the interior of the chicken rather than the exterior and uh, we've just got to give it time to do that. All right. This is like on those cooking shows where they cut away for a little while for the cooking to happen, and that's what's happened on this video. We have been letting the chicken cook. Now, one mistake that a lot of people make is to cut into a piece of meat to see if it's ready. Please don't do that. Please don't ever do that. You're releasing all the juices. What's the point of cooking it if you're just going to dry it all out? Here's my meat thermometer. I'm going to test the temperature of this chicken thigh to make sure that it's done. I think it's done, but I'm not trusting myself. I'm plunging this thermometer right into the center of the chicken thigh. We're going for 160 degrees. Do not serve raw chicken. Do not serve rare chicken. Make sure your chicken is cooked. And it needs to be at 160 degrees, and there we are. Perfect. Don't cook your steak at 160 degrees. It'll be way overcooked. You want to go for 130 for your steak? Please don't heat that steak up to 160. Please don't pull the chicken off at 130. You guys can write that down if you can't remember it. I'm going to remove these. If the class were here, we would now eat these. I would have 15 of them instead of four, but that's one of the opportunities that we're unfortunately going to be missing this spring. Let's go check on the cooler. All right, we're back here at the cooler. Let's see what's happened. Yes. As expected, the ice has melted in the top row. That's good. That means that some cooling is happening. Got a fresh bag of ice. This bag is almost as uncooperative as the other one, but it's, it's still better. Come on, ice. There we go. Thank you. So, now we just close the top up a little bit tight there. We close the top and in 15 minutes those drinks will be ready to go. And if you're saying we want to cool things off faster than that, then you should buy things cold at the grocery store and put them in your refrigerator. I'm not a miracle worker. I can't just make things get cold automatically. If you're in a real pinch, you can put two or three drinks into the bathroom sink and stop up the sink and put ice in there and then turn on the cold water, turn it into slush. Those things will get cold in five minutes. That's the titanic method of cooling things off. I don't recommend it, but if you're desperate, if it's 5.30 in the afternoon, you've had a long day, and you just really need yourself a nice cold Coca-Cola, that's one way to cool it off. Guys, I've enjoyed this opportunity to uh, connect with you today. I'm really sorry that I'm not going to be seeing you at the residence in May but 
I will see you. When my mother was your age, when she was in high school, World War II was raging. And she and her sister and her mom did their part by getting ration books and limiting their supplies of certain food staples that they needed. They would collect scrap metal. They would, do, they would buy war bonds. They would do what they could. We're all doing what we can too, only it's weird to be doing it in the way that we have to. But this is all going to pass, and if I don't see you at the residence in May of 2020, I'll be seeing you. That was another old song from the World War II era. I'll be seeing you in all the old familiar places. Do the best you can this spring. Think about some way that you can do something for somebody else. It helps a lot. I'll be seeing you guys. All the best.